think about possibly the partnership that you know you're in right now if you are in a partnership or think about somebody you're starting to date or somebody that you have been dating and somebody that you will be dating so what is inspired partnership and this is the template that most people do not have and i am observing with great with great delight how some people in their 30s and early 40s right now are really exploring that. Some people who have been doing a lot of personal work, people who have been in men's circles or who were doing divine feminine practices or were on another kind of spiritual or personal development path. Things are hopeful. People are truly waking up to authentic communications. People are truly waking up to the understanding of the body-mind continuum and to the understanding that we're here to for a bigger mission and bigger service. So this is very inspiring. So inspired relationship, partnership is about cultivating, actively cultivating love, growth, and service. And to me, this is the future of relationships. Why also why? And we'll talk about it in a moment. So if you are in a relationship right now, just ask yourself, how are you feeling? You're feeling loved, excited, and relaxed. The need that people have to be excited and challenged and at the same time to feel safe <laughs> and, and to feel protected is a very peculiar need, right? Because very often women are, for example, attracted to bad boys or some kind of situations which are impossible because they excite you. Because there could be some kind of a taboo there because there could be some kind of a desire to burn really fast in an exciting way to go maximalistic into some kind of merging and then into some kind of destruction also of this relationship so the element of excitement is necessary just think about any kind of relationship or a person that you were considering to date who you did not find exciting right who you found oh my god there's nothing for me to do here right? There's nothing for me to do here. So sometimes, unfortunately, a woman feels like, oh, there's nothing for me to do here just because that person is truly emotionally available, just because there's no challenge, because she doesn't have to conquer. The element of excitement has to be there in order for the hormones to work, in order for life to be pumping. And the element of relaxation and feeling safe also has to be there. Being Feeling secure is very important to relax into your soul mission, to relax into, for example, self-growth, into education or into servicing others? Do you find it hard to ask for help or speak your real needs or say no when you're not in abundance to give? So this is how we check how healthy the relationship is that we're in. And of course, many women in relationships and think about the relationship that you had before or having now, feeling ignored or taken for granted, or on the contrary, feeling pressured or controlled, which a lot of women are, or just feeling undesirable. So those are the major challenges that people have in their relationships. And usually those challenges come in after the first kind of sugar phase is over. So what are the reasons for that? The first reason is attracting wrong people. And we always talk about it how healing your love blueprint, which we'll talk about it in a moment, how that helps you to seize attracting wrong people. Attracting people who are critical, emotionally unavailable, narcissistic is natural for somebody who has not yet done her inner work and who is repeating certain generational trauma. For example, attracting a tyrant, and, and I want you to pay close attention here to this to this picture because this is actually the tyrant is a very little man yeah he's a very little man why is he little because he's so preoccupied with his own personal power and appearances he's so preoccupied with control and in some way controlling things also means being feeling very helpless in front of the mystery of nature 
at the end of the day, there are so many things which cannot be controlled, no matter how big of an empire you build or how much money you make, you're still not going to be immortal. So at the end of the day, the most important things like life and death uh, and often health and fate of, fate of the world, you cannot really control. So the tyrant who is trying to push and trying to be this big guy who is who possibly will tell you everything that you're doing wrong. <laughs> I was just recently talking to somebody that she started dating a guy and she's sitting on the couch and he was very particular about where she moves the pillow on the couch and trying to control that. So a little tyrant, yeah, of this like very local geographic area, maybe that geographic area is his apartment or his couch. We attract tyrants when we have known tyrants before. So if this kind of interaction is familiar, if it's familiar that, okay, yeah, somebody can tell me what to do or somebody can criticize me and that's okay. Or somebody can have their own very fixed and rigid rules and I'm just going to always flow around that and this is how just mas masculine is. So if this is something that's familiar, it's possible to attract this kind of tyrant who is going to be not respecting your boundaries, who is going to be strangling you. And the truth is, this behavior is a shadow behavior of the masculine and the reason why many independent, powerful women actually prefer to be single is because they had relationships with those tyrants and it is difficult to give up your freedom. So this is not what inspired relationship is about. Inspired relationship is about having a beautiful relationship with great intimacy of the heart and great intimacy of the body and also maintaining your freedom is something that is extremely important to you so another shadow of the masculine is the weakling okay beloved so let's talk about the weakling i hope you see on um, this picture here it's really funny there are all these emojis under this guy and i wonder why right and the truth is that yeah this guy most likely is addicted to something so he maybe is addicted to his misery or he maybe is addicted to a substance or he maybe is addicted to feeling like a victim so weakling is somebody who is easy to control for a woman okay Some, sometimes it's uh, an alcoholic or some other substance abuser sometimes it's somebody who doesn't really have a, a good career has nothing to show for himself some a woman was considering a guy and um at 43 years old, he, he was just starting his career and he wanted to work two hours a day. And then he said, oh my God, they increased my salary. They doubled my salary. And she was so excited and she said, oh my God, so now things can be better and will be better. And he said, yeah, exactly. They doubled my salary. So now I can work twice as little. So yeah, that's it. That's a weakling. That's a weakling. And some men want, want to continue being a child. And that child, it can be very dangerous because children sometimes are adorable, right? And also sometimes those men children, they feel fresh in the beginning, by the way, then, then that changes too. But for a woman who is powerful, sometimes there is this temptation to take somebody on board and start caring for him in a way a mother would especially if she doesn't she didn't let's say raise boys and she still has this capacity inside of her the truth is most men have a little bit of a tyrant a little bit of a weakling and of course our goal is to be able to identify the king and who is the king the king is a man who is a creator first of all and the king is a man who has created his life, took responsibility for his life, took responsibility for being an adult and still keeping his inner child, of course, and, and being creative and wanting to do new things, try new things, new projects. But somebody who will see the project to the end, somebody who will be resourceful and will be solving things as opposed to be finding excuses why things cannot be solved. That's a king. And sometimes there is a king in the making. So a king also is somebody who has a vision and who has been able to manifest his vision, sometimes by personal sacrifice.
So personal sacrifice could be through discipline. It could be through really investing into some kind of education, or it could be, yeah, and doing something that is not necessarily super pleasant to do and and continuing and being consistent with that and still having faith and still having vision and the most important it's a man who is inspired to help others okay i i I just want to reiterate it again time and time again a man who is self-servient a man who only cares about his own pleasures is not a good partner so a good partner is a generous man with a generous heart who can be flexible, who can sacrifice his own pleasure for something, somebody at large, whether it's his partner, whether it's his family, maybe parents even. A great way to see if that man is a king is actually to ask him about his relationship with his parents. So at the age after 40, a man has to be speaking about his parents or thinking about his parents from the perspective of what he can do for them. So if after 40, a man is still blaming his parents, for example, or he just loves them, whatever be, that is not the king. The king is the one who truly feels like he runs his world and he's responsible for his world, which is very different from a tyrant because the king actually is the one who can be very merciful as well. So th- those are the aspects of the masculine that we need to be looking at when we think about inspired partnership. So what happens when the relationship is unhealthy? It makes us feel alone, it makes us feel like we're not good enough, it makes us feel that we're constantly struggling. Many women feel this way in relationships and when you're single you might think oh my god all this like women they're all married like feeling protected feeling safe feeling probably excited about their sexual interaction with their uh, partner that is not true in fact 65 percent of women have report who are in relationships have reported that those relationships are not making them very happy and uh, many stages for the reason of settling in many stages because They're scared that there's nobody else out there for them. They're scared that, for example, something else could be even worse, that at least this is known. Many come up with excuses that it's for the children because they are really feeling stuck and unable to rewrite a certain part of themselves to to make the change. Here are three reasons why most relationships fail. And this is extremely important right now for you to really pay attention and really get in. First reason is lack of common vision, culture, and purpose. This really is the very first reason why many relationships nowadays fail. Remember how I talked about what was happening in the previous period of history in of the human race. And so most people were from the same culture, right? People were from the same culture. They were si- similar to each other. Sometimes they were matched, right? So what was happening? They had the same expectations right? The expectations were something that often they didn't even need to discuss. So for example, if they shared the same faith, the expectation was we're going to go to church every Sunday, and then we're going to send children to, to Catholic school, and then we need to really persevere, and we need to teach them how to, let's say, pray or like this specific prayer is what we do so here is a culture right there right away so we sit around the table we say those things into the air and now that everything is so out in the open and there are so many relationships where people come from different cultural backgrounds or almost no cultural background at all whatsoever where there are no no rituals, no ways of being together. There are no, really, there is no lifestyle for a couple, which is healthy. That culture of being together has not really been created, honestly, because what was created here, for example, in America, in this country in the 50s was a very particular culture. The guy is working and the woman is looking pretty and cleaning, cleaning, right? And that was that culture. And then that moved into what another culture, which was, okay, now we're all equal. And now nobody knows what to do. There's, there are no rituals. There's like all the expectations go haywire. 
Then all the men get really confused. Do you want me to open the door for you or not? I'm so confused. That's what men are saying. Do you want me to pay for a date for dinner? Or is you, or you're going to be offended that I am feeling that you are not independent enough. So there's really no, like no specific culture right now, how to move forward. And also before certain things were easier in the way that there was less choice. So we might think that, oh, when there is so much choice, it's much easier. But let me tell you, even from the marketing perspective, okay? So every marketer knows, don't give too many choices to the consumer. They're going to buy nothing. So when you give too many choices, it's very difficult to decide. So now people have so much choice to be together, not to be together, to have nine partners, to have all kinds of configuration, to also look into their like gender associations and identifications. And so when there is so much choice, there's also a lot of confusion and not a lot of unity. So there's a lack of common vision, culture, and purpose. So let's bring that in very strongly. And that is one of the reasons why relationships fail often when children grow up, right? Children grow up, the purpose is over. What are we doing together now, now, right? What are we building together? What are we creating together? We don't know. And then boredom comes in. And when there is no common purpose at at a certain point, as it dies out, that excitement that we talked about is one of the primary needs in the relationship. It dies out. If I'm 100% sure that you love me, I love you, we all love each other. What are we doing? Where are we going? What's happening? So how can we make this exciting? And so this is what Inspired Relationship is about. And I'll give you the exact answer to those questions, how we handle that. So the second one, of course, is a damaged love blueprint where people feel that they're not good enough or they feel like they can't authentically communicate their needs. People feel like um, they have to be fighting for power or attention and that, of course, comes from the damage love blueprint, which is the template that they've received from their childhoods. And many people can't even survive when another person truly loves them. They start taking this other person for granted. For many people, it's difficult to like, really come into exploration and appreciation of good things that they have, period, not only in a relationship but in their life in general so that again is a sign of damaged love blueprint when we don't appreciate what we have just because we don't appreciate truly ourselves or our lives or our world this also goes together with lack of reverence for creation and lack of gratitude all right so the third reason why many relationships fail is lack of pleasure, all right? So now our principle of pleasure first will really truly come in. So what's happening with many couples, they start maybe with a lot of pleasure. In the beginning, the hormones are possibly working and raging and there's this chemical cocktail, so exciting. And then life comes in. And when life comes in, all of a sudden, they're so preoccupied with um, careers or so preoccupied with action that pleasure gets sacrificed. And again, when we talk about pleasure, beloveds, we don't only talk about self-servient pleasure that comes through the senses. This is one of the pleasures, right? The pleasure of experiencing that you're full and nourished with food or the pleasure of tasting things or listening to things or seeing beautiful things or sensual pleasure. Those are incredible pleasures of the body. But then there are also pleasures of the heart. And beloved, it's the biggest pleasure of the heart is love love is the biggest pleasure of the heart and so those pleasures spiritual pleasures being in elevated states of ecstatic union with your soul when you may be singing or dancing or just sitting in light and sitting with nature or doing something together with a crowd of people who are smiling and who are looking at you with love those kind of pleasures, also pleasures of bringing in new ideas, inspiring ideas, moving forward, imagining beautiful futures for your partnership and for the earth. So usually all that pleasure gets sacrificed and people just fall into those pockets, fall into the vortexes and pockets when the most important thing gets forgotten. And so then they just come back together after the day of work and they just like 
so exhausted and without skills or tools how to cultivate love, self-growth, and pleasure in a relationship. Without those tools, without education, they fall into inertia. They fall into coping strategies rather than empowered strategies where they can create their own culture, their own culture for their relationship. Those are the four, four pillars of an inspired relationship, the answer to all of those issues, all of those problems. And those four pillars is what makes a relationship truly successful, powerful, inspired, and what is going to help you realize yourself in this lifetime. We talked a little bit about the vision already, which is a unified vision of not only values in terms of what's good and what's bad, but also based on that, what is it that is the most important for us in this life? And so that alignment has to be there. What is the most important for us? So I'm actually going to give you some examples from different types of partnerships. So for example, for some people, the, the most important thing in their life is to care for their children. And that is a pretty simple kind of value, family value to align with and observe. And so some people really envision, co create, co-create the kind of space, nurturing warm space around the big table where many people are welcome. So this is one very accessible culture that can be created. Another one could be something like, yeah, we want to get enlightened. And that is the most important thing for us, our own self-realization in light equanimity of love and service and so then that is the most important vision that is the most important co-creation and we are what is called dharma brothers dharma sisters walking on that path of self-realization and bringing all the shadows into light and coming into oneness so that could be something that unites us in our vision. There could be a different vision and culture. It could be a vision that so we are artists and so we are refining, developing our art and possibly even collaborating within our art. Another one could be we are very powerful manifestors, business people, career people, amazing. We're creating wealth. We're creating success. We're creating abundance that later on or in the process, we are so lucky and so blessed that we can serve as a hand of God and, and we can be that hand that brings in a miracle into the world. When, For example, we, we have all this wealth and all this money and somebody needs some kind of help to cure their disease and that person can be losing hope and all of a sudden somebody comes in yeah here is some money for you we're going to fund you we're going to help you and so when we do that we operate in some way as that miracle because for that person who's receiving it's like oh my god not only i got the money to help to help me recover and fight for my life but also i got the, this insertion, the, this this pump of faith. I got this, oh my God, yeah, there are people who care. I believe in the goodness of the world. I believe in humanity. I believe in love. And I believe in, in miracles. And so that way, two people who are just accumulating all this money and moving forward in business, they can become this vehicle. They can become a vehicle of a miracle of the hand of God. So that could be also this incredible alignment of vision and co-creation. So when we talk about the body and the connection on the level of the body, the body has its own intelligence and the body has its own wisdom and it has its own desires. It has its own fears and it has power. It has a lot of power and bodies get very polluted. Just like our minds get polluted, bodies also get very polluted. So the pollution comes from sedentary lifestyle, terrible food, pressure, unprocessed emotions, self-hatred, anger. So the bodies get very polluted. What needs to happen for two people to have this connection on that level of the body on the primal level is to detox, really. To detox and to come into deeper connection with their animalistic self. So I worked with many couples 
over the last 14 years or so. And I want to tell you that more than anything, couples love primal therapy. And so primal therapy is when I ask them to scream at each other <laughs> and turn into wild animals. And when they turn into wild animals, all of a sudden there is this nakedness that comes in. There is this intimacy that comes in. And all of a sudden people come into that primal raw fire into that primal, the, like all of a sudden those instinctual things become available, roaring or feeling, yeah, you, you can really connect with someone. You can play with someone. You can fight even someone in the erotic way as well. And so coming into that primal connection with your own body through primal therapy, dances, shaking, and doing things in nature like creating fire or going into the ocean, putting your hands into the earth, all those things help us embody. And when we are in that space, we can healthily connect with each other much better. Just like if you see dogs running around and playing, right? They have no problems. Yeah, they just like, and so the same way we can go through the body in this primal way. So that connection has to be there. Although, of course, there are some people who are very disconnected from their body and from each other's body. And it seems like some people are totally okay with that in their partnerships. But most of the time, one person is more embodied and another person is disconnected from their body. And very often, it's a woman who doesn't like how her man is touching her, for example, or how he's not like really in touch with what's going on. And what happens is often she loses desire and then resentment comes in. So it's just so important to come into this embodiment. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the heart and the power, and then we're going to go into an exercise. Our hearts have been going through a very difficult journey, especially in the last several years been threatened they they felt in, uh, insecure even with what we have to deal with at work the the reality is the competition of capitalistic society is pushing everyone to to the last drop really to work to their last drop to okay are you exhausted enough yet or, or we need to make you more exhausted and companies are doing that because other companies are doing that. And, and if you can imagine, there is one company that is just, okay, guys, you can all work five hours a day. There's going to be three days off, right? Everything's going to be just great. We're going to be fine. But then another company is, no, guys, you're going to be working 60 hours a week and you're going to have one day off and you should be available after hours which company do you think is going to win most likely the one that's like really pressuring their employees so because of that the culture that exists right now in the united states of america is very work oriented and so people are pressured so much the survival mode and that mode just became normalized beloved became normalized and we then we just forget how does it feel to how does it feel to feel safe and secure so our heart has been going through so much not to mention obviously egoism and narcissism and, and not being cared for in the wild west of love on the, but the reality is that the heart is a fragile being it's a fragile bird that needs to be cared for and needs to be handled with great attention and care. And in, in the inspired partnership, there is a mechanism that ensures that people are holding each other's heart like that, that they're holding each other's heart in sacredness and um, caring for each other's heart. And I'm here to tell you that if somebody doesn't care about your heart and your heart feeling safe and, and joyful, that is not a person to be with, period, end of story. That's it. So this needs to be an assumption. In any conversation, you can say, and of course, I know that you want my heart to be happy and joyful, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be together, right? Of course, I know you want that for me. So this is a very important point to understand. And this, like, this is a deal breaker right here. If they don't care about your heart, 
if they don't care, like, why am I spending the time of my life with somebody who doesn't care about my heart? The whole world doesn't care already about my heart. So why would I be in a unique, particular, exclusive situation with somebody who doesn't, right? And then the power when a woman is really used to be leading with her masculine, what we see is a lot of power play and a lot of uh, situations when a woman actually feels very uncomfortable when she depends at least a little bit on, on the masculine. So she starts to emasculate the masculine and she starts to be very critical and she starts to micromanage and she starts to do all those things which are act- actually just strangling him and cutting him off from his own resources of masculinity. And that is detrimental for some men, especially if their mother already did that. And so in the place of power, again, there is a play there should be tools that will help you figure out what are the activities where he's the most important, like veto kind of person. And then there are other activities where the feminine is leading. And in every activities, one person can be the, the leader. And in some other activities, the leader can be somebody else. And that feels like it's the most efficient distribution of power in a partnership. Based on those principles, there are four, there are four cornerstones of an inspired partnership. When we become co-visionaries, success catalysts, heart guardians, and pleasure partners for each other. So co-visionaries is dreaming and creating impactful, positive changes for themselves and for the world. That's number one. Number two, success catalysts. Each partner fuels the other's personal and professional growth and achievements. Number three, hard guardians. Each partner devotedly protects and nurtures the other's emotional well-being and love. And the last one is pleasure partners. And that's the pleasure first principle. Each individual actively explores and enhances the other's joy and sensual full. So I'd like for you to think about three partnerships that you've had and the ones who are you're considering or the ones you're in and analyze them from this perspective, from the perspective of the framework of the inspired partnership. Yeah, from the perspective of those four cornerstones that we talked about. And before you go into the uh, breakout rooms, I would like to hear, because it's such a small group today, I want to hear from each one of you, what was the most important um, about what you just learned or heard? What resonated with you the most? So let's talk about looks. By the way, yeah, I read Body Keep the Score. It's an amazing book. Talking about looks. So a person who is on that level, who who basically has those a possibility to connect to you and be equal on the four pillars usually will look good because looking good is more about looking healthy. So I can tell you that many people, if they spend a couple of months in Himalayas doing yoga every day and eating very refined food and praying, they'll probably look good, most likely. That's what I mean about detoxing because looking good is about the soul coming through the eyes. Looking good is about the body losing its stealth, so to speak, of protection. So looking good is the fire. That's looking good. All right. Okay. So my next question is, I am in now, like when I do start dating or when I do start getting back into wanting to look for a partner, how do I find these things after a couple dates? Does it take more than a couple dates to realize that they have the good qualities or the bad qualities? That's an excellent question. Thank you so much. All right. So let, let's look through. Everybody wants to know this, right? Co-visionaries. That's very easy. First of all, in, in our classes that come up, you'll understand what really are your values and your mission and, and your soul alignment. What's the most important for you? That's number one. Because otherwise, it's not possible to know what I what are you going to co-vision or co-create with this person if you don't know what you want to create or what you're envisioning for yourself. And so to find that out, 
first of all, his track record, what they've done so far, and also to see what their dreams are just following our framework of uh, instant emotional connection. When we ask a person where, where they are from, what their dreams were when they were a child, and what their dreams are now and what's in the way. That is a very good mechanism to see where they are at. You can also ask something like, so if you had a, several million dollars, what would you do with it? And so some people are just gonna say, oh, I'm just gonna make more money. And then you can say, so what would you do with more money? And then that person will tell you exactly. They're, they're going to tell you, yeah, I'll buy several houses, I'll have a yacht, I will. And then you'll see exactly where they are at on the evolution, in the evolution of consciousness, what brings them the highest pleasure. And remember how we talked about there are some souls that their highest pleasure is just to experience something pleasant in a sense of physical sensation. Then the next level of the soul is when Oh, it brings me pleasure to give food to other people. So my biggest pleasure is when others are, when I'm providing an experience for the others to have pleasant physical sensations or providing experience for others to feel safe. Then the biggest pleasure for somebody else is spiritual, personal real self-realization and growth. And for somebody else is to provide that or facilitate that spiritual growth and personal realization to others. So you're going to see exactly where they're at. They might say, look, when I make $5 million, I'm just going to donate this money. Okay, great. Where are you going to donate? What's your vision? What's your purpose? Oh, I'm going to build dog shelters in Nepal. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to empower all this disempowered, but women with a vision in Eastern Europe. Okay, amazing. Or I'm going to... I don't know, buy a house for my parents. Okay, great. What are you going to do? So that is one thing that you can find out really fast. And I'll tell you something else in terms of deserving mind and also your own realization of yourself as a sacred woman. Your energy, your precious energy, your wisdom, whatever you invested in your own self and the gift that you are or like to begin with, where do you want to invest that? What project, like by investing your love into a guy, into a man, or into any kind of interaction, the question is, am I inspired by your purpose? Are you inspired by his purpose? Because if you're not inspired by his purpose, that's exactly what's going to make it all boring. But if you are inspired by his vision and his purpose, then what is possible is that when he absolutely loves you, it's not boring because you guys are on a mission. Okay, can you see that? So that's how it works. Okay, so the next one, success catalyst, that's very easy too. You'll see what, first of all, how successful he is. And second of all, when you talk about something, how he supports you, does he give you the words of support? Does he say, oh yeah, you can do it. Oh, I can see. Oh, I appreciate what you've done. Like I remember at a certain point, my, my daughter was dating some guy and my daughter is a psychotherapist. Oh, she didn't even date him. It was in the very beginning. And he said to her, I don't know how you work with people all the time. That's impossible. It's just so awful. And she told me that and she said, is that a red flag? And I said, yes, it is a red flag, right? It is a red flag. We want him to truly fully support and say, oh, it's in, what you're doing is incredible. And I'm fully behind it. And I'm proud of you. And also when you talk about your own, for example, aspirations and challenges, see how he reacts. Is, is he going to be offering you resources? Is he going to say, oh my God, you want to put this beautiful wallpaper on your wall? I know, I just know, I know a store. So see how he's coming in with support to see if he's going to be your success catalyst, right? Hard guardians could be a little bit more tricky, but of course, uh, one way to find out how, how does your heart feel in his presence? Does it feel warm and you can relax? Does it feel like you're accepted or do you feel ugly after talking to him and judged? And I was just talking also to someone. Oh, yeah. I was talking to someone who said, oh, I can't eat yet, but I'll have a, something to drink if possible. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this woman tried to date this guy with a very strong inner feminine 
And that guy was all about his, his own self. And I said, okay, maybe he, he achieved so much. So maybe it's okay. And she said, I, I felt so ugly after talking to him. So most likely he's not going to be a hard guardian, this kind of a guy. There is a danger here to feel too comfortable and too well-received if there is somebody on the other side who, who is a narcissist. So this is something that is going to take more than one meeting to find out if he can truly guard your heart, all right? And pleasure partners, first of all, see how embodied he is, how embodied is he. So see if he is conscious of his hands, of his mouth, of his breathing. If he is able to stay in the present with you, at least a little bit. But if you see that he's talking a mile a minute, da, 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 most likely he's not going to be your pleasure partner. Most likely not. Okay. But if he is here, he provides a calm presence and he means well, he can be a pleasure partner. And also see how he also treats the world. How is he appreciating things or does he just grab things, right? Or is he like open to really come into deeper intimacy with the world? There is enough friction in the world and enough antagonistic and antagonistic forces. The relationship is to make your life easier and your mission more achievable and you and it and needs to increase your pleasure. The power, like I don't want to say struggle, I want to say play. Power play can be also there a little bit exciting and you can tease each other. But from the conscious perspective, again the best paradigm of power distribution is to allow both people to be in power in their respected areas of expertise, which are uh, discussed consciously in the very beginning or throughout the relationship to say, okay, listen, hey, I love it. I love your continuous support. I love your continuous leadership. Oh my God, this makes me feel so, so protected and and I can relax with you. I really like it how you always hold my hand when we're going places and you're showing me where to step. Although I know where to step, <laughs> but, but I'm joking. But really, yeah, you can go into that receptive mode in that space and just let him lead. And then in certain places, okay, the curtain, the color of the curtains in the living room, that's mine, okay? So that's where I'm leading. And just knowing that both people can realize themselves as leaders in different areas, that's a very winning power combination. And there could be some areas where there could be a little bit of teasing and push and pull a little bit in discussion. And that's a bit of that traction that could be a little bit exciting. But overall, if, it, if there is too much of it, that takes the relationship or to the, into the space. Unless people are truly growing, working with someone, growing through those things, crystallizing themselves into intimacy okay then it's great but if not it is just as i said it just really not productive so the way the king shows up is follow me you know i'm here follow me the king shows up as support as a rock as and then, oh my god next to the king you're gonna feel safe you're gonna breathe you're gonna be like oh my god I am protected. That is the most important thing next to a king. Okay. Okay. And as a queen, I also really like the paradigm when a queen has a vision and she says, we need to do this. We need to do this. Can you please be my executive force? And he will execute her vision. So this is something, this is a very good. I wish I knew those things when I was 35. Yeah. I also didn't. And that's number one. Number two, yeah, it's human conditions. Like we're all trying, learning how to love, right? And now we're learning how to love in freedom. It's a whole new exploration. Nobody knows how to do it yet. We're like a little bit of a blind kitten, just yeah, trying, you know? So forgive that. Yeah, of course it wasn't perfect. It's okay. We're going to do better next time. All right. Okay. Thank you. When we start talking about magnetic communications and how to really make a guy want to be your true partner, it's all about co-dreaming. It's going to be like, yeah, you have this dream and I am the ultimate personification of your dream. That queen you were dreaming about, that's me.
That's the ultimate seduction. It's not, oh my God, you're going to experience something you've never experienced before. Maybe only in the beginning we can use that gimmick. But at the end of the day, for real, especially with high quality people, high quality men, it's that. So if you would like to feel free, sensual, desirable, and protected in your relationship, book a call with me. Let's talk. And I'm going to share with you the incredible tools from my treasury box that I've been collecting for 20 years, working with more than 3,000 people. So I'm extending this invitation if you are serious about your love life and if you are committed to your own happiness, then book a call with me and let's talk.